Well, good morning. My name is Christian. I'm one of the pastors here at Cornerstone. I have the opportunity to open up God's Word with us this morning. Uh, if you've been with us over the last few weeks, you know that we are in the middle of our summer series through the book of Isaiah. Uh, we've been spending um, uh, the last couple of months in it, and we'll be in it through the, the end of Labor Day. But this morning, we're going to look at a chunk of, uh, of chapters, not all at once. We're mainly going to spend our time in, time in chapter 19. So if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and open up there. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, we got some ushers who would love to put a Bible in your hands. But as we get going, would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much again for having us together this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to open your word. Lord, would you uh, calm our hearts? Would you focus our minds? The various things that have gone on this week, good, bad, indifferent. Lord, would you just settle us now as we turn to your word? And through this, would we turn to you and see you as the solid rock on which we can stand? We pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. So up until this point in our time through the book of Isaiah, we've been looking mainly at the messages of judgment and hope that God brings to the people of Judah. But what we're going to see beginning this week and next week is what happens starting in chapter 13 is the scope of the book widens. And what we have starting in chapter 13 is a whole series of messages of judgment and hope now communicated to the nations around the people of Judah. So I'm going to throw a couple maps up here for us just to, to help set the stage for what we're going to be looking at this morning. Now, if you know where we're looking on the map right now, you've kind of got this little bit of, of space of land where God had placed his people, Israel and Judah. To the south and west, you have the entire continent of Africa. To the east, you have all, uh, north and east, you have all of Asia. To the west, you have all of Europe. That God placed his people here at the junction of the continents, at the, what I like to call the 405 of the ancient world, where all travel and commerce had to pass through. And we've been seeing how their entire uh, existence in this land was based upon their reliance upon God. There were always much bigger, more powerful nations around them. And the only way that there would be stability in their lives was if they remained true to the Lord. And the judgment passages we've been seeing up to this point is all about God confronting His people for the way they've turned away from Him. But what begins to happen starting in chapter 13 is there's a series of messages about these nations all around them. And it's helpful to kind of see where they are on the map so we have an idea of what we're dealing with here. Israel is kind of this, this tug-of-war rope in between these larger powers. And this is a time of tremendous uh, tension and instability in the Middle East, which I guess you could say is kind of like saying it was a cold day in Antarctica because the Middle East has always been unstable. But at this point, the main instability that the people of Israel are dealing with is the Assyrians. That big circle up to the north, that's the big dominant superpower. That's the people who were seeking to control everything in this region and, and control that strategic passageway. And what we see, and we've learned in the last couple chapters, like in chapter 7, is that the smaller kingdoms like the Syrians, the Philistines, the Moabites, they're all trying to go, how do we deal with the Assyrian threat? Let's bind together, let's form alliances, let's present a united resistance against Assyria. They're even going down to Egypt and trying to rope the Egyptians into it, thinking that, that, that maybe the old oppressive empire will help them fight off the new oppressive empire. They're trying to rope in the people of Judah and even threatening to attack the people of Judah if they don't join the resistance. But this is where Isaiah, over and over again, keeps saying, don't join the resistance. Don't look for your stability from the surrounding nations. Look to God. Trust Him. And so what we see in this whole section is another way in which God is confronting His people for their, their unwillingness to turn to Him and trust in Him. Because for all of these messages that Isaiah brings about the surrounding nations, he was not a traveling prophet. He wasn't like someone like Jonah, who God sent to the Assyrians with a message of judgment. Everything we see in these chapters are messages that Isaiah spoke while still being in and around Jerusalem. So while he's talking about the other nations, his audience is still the people of Judah. This is another way that God is saying, 
Why are you looking to them for your stability? Why are you looking to them for help? You're like two drowning guys in the middle of the ocean trying to hold on to each other to stay afloat. It's, it's not going to work out well for either of you. Don't look to them. Look to me. You're living in fear of the Assyrians because you've forgotten to fear me. So here, let me tell you in chapter 14 what I have in store for the Assyrians. Look to me. You want your stability, your security from the surrounding nations, but they won't do it. Look what I have in store for them in those chapters. Don't trust in them, trust in me. The basic point of the entirety of Isaiah 13 through 27 is, is basically like the old song. On Christ the solid rock I stand because all other ground is what? Sinking sand. God's confronting His people that the places and the people that they're looking to for security are sinking sand. And He's about ready to shake the whole sandbox up. That's what's going on in this section. So, as we begin, let me ask you this question. Here's what I was asking myself this week. When your life feels unstable, when things seem out of control, where do you turn for stability? Where do you look for hope? What is the, your knee-jerk reaction? Where do you turn first? I was thinking about an experience in my life, and no joke, I was thinking about the Northridge earthquake, and this was Wednesday, before the big earthquakes of Thursday and Friday. So I was like, huh, maybe I should share this story even more so. When I was a kid, I remember all the time growing up in school, we would do earthquake drills. You guys remember those? Or they would teach you to duck and cover, get down under the desk, and stay there until the teacher says, okay, it's done. And then we'd stand up, we'd walk outside the classroom, we'd go to the schoolyard, and then the, the principal would talk to us about what else would be going on if it was an actual emergency. And the whole reason for those earthquake drills was so that if there actually was an earthquake during school hours, we would immediately know what to do. Now, uh, thank God, there was never a major earthquake while I was a kid in school. That Northridge earthquake happened at what, like four in the morning? But I do remember when that happened, my, my grandparents lived in Granada Hills at the time, and their, their house was like significantly damaged. And our, we were out of school for the week. It was kind of, oh, sweet, in the middle of January, this kind of week of vacation. But because my grandparents' house was so damaged, they came and lived with us for a little bit. And every day we would go to their house and help them start cleaning up because it was such a mess. And I remember there would always be aftershocks every day. And it was like, okay, quick, the house is shaking, get in the doorway, go outside, something like that. And then one day, we, we had taken a break from cleaning up. We were eating lunch out on their back patio when there was that one day where there was like two five-point something aftershocks within like 10 minutes of each other. And we're sitting out in the patio, and I just immediately went into earthquake drill mode. I dropped under that ta patio table, and I stayed there. Good, I know what to do. I was trained for this, right? And then I hear my mom shouting, Christian, get out of there. It's not safe. This is what they told me to do. They, they, they taught me this in school, mom. Duck and cover. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. And she said, Christian, look up. And I looked up and realized that I was hunkered down under this big glass top patio table. And she goes, if anything falls, you will get hurt. It is not safe. Oh, so I didn't stick around to find out, and thank God that the table didn't break. But I just remember, for me, that was the scariest moment of the entire Northridge earthquake experience. Because I did what I thought I was supposed to do. I turned to what I thought was a safe place. And I remember afterward just going, is there anywhere safe anymore? And I think that's a lot like what God is doing in this section. You're stumbling, you're staggering, things are uncertain, and everything you try to grab hold on is going to crumble in your grasp too. They've put themselves in a very precarious position because they're looking to anyone except the Lord. And so what God is doing in this section is like what my mom said to me, I know you think it's safe there, but it's not. So again, where do you turn when your life feels unstable? Some of us turn inward. We just go, shoot, I was made for this. We white-knuckle it, we grab control, and we try to will ourselves through the situation. Some of us withdraw. You turn away. Some of you, you literally run. Maybe you're here in Simi Valley because you ran from a tough situation before. Some of us run, withdraw and run away by just shutting down emotionally, and you don't let anyone talk to you about it. You just go into sleep mode. 
Some of you run away from hard circumstances by distracting yourself with entertainment, with alcohol. Does any of that help? Do you run to people when life feels unstable? Run to people for help? Maybe run to people just to vent and complain about how unfair your situation is? Some people run to others for help in the midst of instability so that they can run away. Here, you take it. I don't know what to do. I'm gone. Do you turn to God? Do you seek to trust God? I mean, trusting God in the midst of instability doesn't mean that life isn't unstable. But you look to Him as that rock, that refuge, either to rescue you from the situation or to give you the endurance to remain in that situation. Running to people often, uh, running to God often looks like running to people. I mean, that's why the church exists, is to be there as a support to each other. But we never run to each other as a replacement for depending upon God. All of us, no matter good or strong or, or admirable you might be, you are a sorry replacement for God in anyone else's life. Where do you turn when life feels unstable? It's during times of uncertainty that we find out where we really trust, what we really put our hope in. We can sing all we want, and we'll sing the song again. I will build my life upon your love. It's the firm foundation. I will put my trust in you alone, and I will not be shaken. But it's precisely when our lives are shaken up that we find out, okay, what is the foundation my life is built on? And that's actually what, one of the reasons why God takes us through uncertainty. To reveal where our hope really lies. And to show us how unstable everything else is but Him. One of the places in this whole section of Isaiah that, that illustrates this the best is in chapter 19. So go ahead and turn there now. In chapter 19, Isaiah goes after what God says to the people of Egypt. And in this section, there's a ton of irony because if you know your Old Testament, you know there's a lot of baggage when it comes to the relationship between Israel and Egypt. If you helped out with VBS or your kids were here for VBS, this is the story we took them through. The story of the Exodus. The story of the people of Israel being enslaved for 400 years by the Egyptians. They cry out to the Lord and God sends Moses to say to Pharaoh, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, no, ten oh, I guess nine different times. And then after the tenth plague, God showing his power over all the gods of the Egyptians, he says, okay, you can go. And yet now here we are some 700 years later from the Exodus. And the Israelites have so forgotten who they are and have so forgotten who their God is that they will more quickly turn to their old slave masters for help than to the God who rescued them from slavery. And so what God does in this chapter is he uses a lot of imagery from the Exodus in, Exodus 19, in Isaiah 19 as a way to kind of jog the people's memory. Does this sound familiar to you? You think you're going to find help from the Egyptians. Let me tell you what I have in store for the Egyptians. He's warning his people. What, he's gonna, what you'll see over the course of this chapter as we walk through it is that he's both warning the Israelites, don't look to the Egyptians for your security. And he's also reminding the Israelites of his mission. His mission ultimately to bring blessing even to nations like the Egyptians. So let's take a look at this. Isaiah chapter 19, verses 1 and 2. It says this, An oracle concerning Egypt. Behold, the Lord is riding on a swift cloud and comes to Egypt, and the idols of Egypt will tremble at his presence, and the hearts of the Egyptians will melt within them. And very much what God did through the ten plagues in the time of Moses. Showed himself superior to all the might of the Egyptians and all the gods of the Egyptians. I'm going to come and they're going to remember who I am and they will tremble again. I'll stir up Egyptians against Egyptians and they will fight each against another and each against his neighbor. City against city and kingdom against kingdom. And the spirit of the Egyptians within them will be emptied out. And they will inquire of the idols and the sorcerers and the mediums, those who consult spirits, and the necromancers, those who consult the dead. 
And I will give over the Egyptians into the hand of a hard taskmaster, and a fierce king will rule over them, declares the Lord of hosts. Again, there's a lot of Exodus imagery in here. If you're familiar with the story of the Exodus, do you remember how at least the first, when, when uh, God turned the Nile River into blood and sent like frogs and flies, the Egyptian uh, magicians could do the same things. By their secret arts, they could do the same things, which really only made the problem worse, right? Like, oh good, more frogs, thanks guys. That really helped. But at a certain point, they could no longer replicate was get what God is doing. And the Egyptian magicians and sorcerers themselves said, this is the finger of God. We can't do this. And so again, God is saying, I, they're going to go to all the best of their culture, all the best of their wisdom, and I will confound it. You won't be able to keep up with me. And, I, and here's what's so, so remarkable in verse 4. He says, I will give the Egyptians over into the hand of a hard master. I will flip the script. I will turn the tables. Your former slave masters will be slaves to a harsh master themselves. I will set a fierce king over them. I think he's talking here about the Assyrians. The Assyrians will sweep in and take over everything for a while. A fierce king will rule over them, declares the Lord. In chapters 5-10, through 10, I won't go through all of this, but he goes after the Nile River. He talks about this, this river which was the lifeblood. Literally, the, the only way that there was a civilization there in the area of Egypt. The only thing that set them apart from the Sahara Desert on either side. And again, he's pulling from the imagery of the Exodus. Remember when I turned this to blood? Well, what I'm going to do in the future, it's not just going to turn to blood. I'm going to dry it up completely. And all commerce and fishing and agriculture will dry up with it. In verse 11, he comes back to this idea of the, the supposed wisdom and learning of the Egyptians, and he calls it utterly foolish. The wisest counselors of Pharaoh will give stupid counsel. How can you say to Pharaoh, I'm a son of the wise, I'm a son of ancient kings? Where are your wise men? How much, what does your wise wisdom all amount to? Man, you don't even know what I have purposed against the Egyptians. The princes of Zoan have become fools. The princes of Memphis are deluded. Those who are cornerstones of her tribes have made Egypt stagger. Even more than that, he says in verse 14, I've done this. I have actually muddied the waters even more for the wise men of Egypt. So they won't be able to tell which way's up. He says they will make Egypt stagger in all its deeds as a drunken man staggers in his vomit. There is some imagery for you. You don't see this verse on too many Christian coffee mugs. <laughs> but again, follow this imagery. This is someone who has so given themselves over to alcohol that they are stumbling and they've made themselves sick. They vomited and now they're slipping in their own vomit. And yet they go, no, no, dude, I'm, I'm good. Like, seriously, here, come on, I'll give you a, drive, I'll give you a ride home. And basically what God's saying is, really? You're... You're going to entrust your safety to that? You're going to ride home with that? You're going to look to them instead of me? He says in verse 15, there's going to be nothing to do for Egypt. There's nothing for Egypt that head or tail, palm branch or reed may do. He's saying to them again, don't look for help from those who when the time comes won't even be able to help themselves. That's the warning. Don't turn to Egypt. Turn to the Lord. And for us, it's the same. The question I asked you a couple of minutes ago, what do you turn to when life feels unstable and out of control? Is it actually any more stable than what you're going through? Can it actually do what you're hoping it will do? Will the next election cycle actually yield any different outcomes than the last? Not saying we shouldn't vote. We ought to use our vote responsibly. But our hope should not lie in elected officials. Will your house really retain its value? Or will, when will the next bubble burst? Some of you lived through that last one 10 years ago or so. And you're kind of coming back up for air from it. Things are stabilizing again. But do not put your hope in the real estate market. Not that we shouldn't have homes, places to live. But again, that's not where our hope should lie. 
all that can still be shaken, as we saw this week. Is that overpriced education for which you will submerge yourself in debt actually going to land you the stable job you hope it will? Is there any such thing as a stable job anymore? And not only that, is a career, a job, where we should be looking for our stability in the first place? Basically, so much of this comes back to what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. Here he's speaking of treasure, but again, treasure, what your heart attaches to is just another place of talking about where your hope, where your foundation lies. He says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where it is secure, where it can't be shaken, where moth won't eat it, rust won't de degrade it, thieves can't steal it. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Our hearts attached to what we hope in, and we hope in what our hearts, hearts are attached to. And so he says, make sure you place your hope in the right place. Find your stability, your security, your future in God and the kingdom that he is bringing. That's the firm foundation on which we build our lives. Put your confidence and the one who said that he would build his church and even the gates of hell would not prevail against it. Put your confidence in the one who when all the forces of hell and all the forces of human rebellion did their worst to him, rose victorious from the dead three days later. That's the person you place your confidence in. Place your confidence in the one who right now is seated at the right hand of God, ruling over all things, and is moving all of culture and history and the universe to his intended phenomenal conclusion. That's where you place your hope. Place your hope in the one who isn't just talking about one making one particular nation great again, but in the one who's made the promise to make all things new, and to gather people from every tribe and tongue and language and nation. That's where you build your confidence. Amen? That's the person you build your life around. On Christ the solid rock, that's where we must stand because all other ground is sinking sand. That's the message the people of Judah needed to hear. That's the message we need to hear. And as we continue in this chapter, that's the message that ultimately God says the Egyptians will hear. Look at verse 16. Check this out. Five times in this last part of this chapter, uh, uh, Isaiah uses this phrase, in that day. And I've highlighted it up there for you because this is a marker. This is an indicator for us that Isaiah is talking about something bigger than just current events. He has now cast his vision, or maybe God has drawn his vision, to the more ultimate future, to what's often referred to by the prophets as the day of the Lord, the great climactic action of God in which he will judge his enemies and rescue those who trust in him. And he's talking about that day in here. And look at what he says about the former slave owners of the Israelites. Look at what he says will happen in that day to the Egyptians. Verse 16, in that day, the Egyptians will be like women and tremble in fear. Okay, now, hold on a second here. Hold on. Some of you are all, hey, you, you, I watched you, you crossed your arms right then. Wait a second here. Remember here. Okay, just one second. This is an ancient document. This was written two thousand or somewhere around 2,700 years ago. And so the way that Isaiah, or God speaking through Isaiah will use language, may offend our current sensibilities, but we can't expect it to, to be written like it's written to us today. I don't want you to miss, because this at the first reading can sound sexist to us, but I don't want you to miss the main point. Within ancient cultures, this is all talking about fear in the face of combat, in the face of warfare. And within most ancient cultures and most current cultures, Women are not expected to fight battles. They are not expected nor trained to engage in warfare. So don't trip over it. The main point of what he's saying here is it's those who are fearful and unprepared for combat. And so if this offends you, just, just here's a similar metaphor. It's like saying that there's a bunch of computer programmers that are going to go up against some green berets. 
They're, they're not going to, or you could say pastors. I'm fine with that one too. A, bunch, a group of pastors against some special forces. They're not going to stand the chance. That's what he's saying. They will stand no chance in that day. The land of Judah will become a terror to the Egyptians. Everyone to whom it is mentioned will fear because of the purpose that the Lord has purposed against them. The mere mention of the name of the people of Judah will strike fear into the hearts of the Egyptians. But then look at verse 18. In that day, there will be five cities in the land of Egypt that speak the language of Canaan and swear allegiance to the Lord of hosts. They will be so fearful and so decimated by what God does to them that those who remain will go, okay, this is the guy we got to get behind. This is the God we need to trust. In. They will swear allegiance to the Lord of hosts. Look at the next part. This is what's just phenomenal to me. Check this out. In that day, there will be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar to the Lord at its border. It will be a sign and a witness to the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. When they cry to the Lord because of oppressors, he will send them a savior and defender and deliver them. Now, earlier in this chapter, we saw how God flips the table on the Egyptians. The former slave masters become the slaves themselves. But he goes even further and he says, once you're in the position that my people were in, you will cry out to me just like they did. And just as I sent them Moses to deliver them, I will send you a deliverer to rescue you. Look at verse 21. And the Lord will make himself known to the Egyptians. And the Egyptians will know the Lord in that day. This is very relational language. This is not just know of the Lord. This is experiential. In the same way that God showed the Israelites who he was during the Exodus. And at the end, they knew who their God was. He says, I will do the same thing for the people of Egypt. Worship and sacrifice and offering, and they will make vows to the Lord and perform them. And the Lord will strike Egypt, striking and healing, and they will return to the Lord. And he will listen to their pleas for mercy and heal them. Egypt? The house of slavery? They will cry out to the Lord. He will listen to their pleas for mercy and heal them? This is incredible, but this is the, you know, the, the classic telemercial. Uh, tele, uh, uh, I don't know, the infomercial. There's the word. There's more. It gets even better. Look at the next part. Verse 23. In that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. Now, let me put the map up again so you can see. Again, these are the, the two poles, the two opposite ends of the political international spectrum at that time. The two that are playing tug of war with everything in between. And God says, in that day, in the ultimate work of God, there will be a highway between these two countries. Highways in the prophets are always often, often used symbolically to talk about open relationship, open communication, reconciliation. He's talking about the international reconciliation and unity that will happen when the fullness of God comes. And not only that, he says, because there's this highway, they're going to travel to each other and they'll come together. The Egyptians will worship with the Assyrians. I think Egypt and Assyria here are, are being used in very symbolic ways to talk about the, the major world powers, the major tension creators at the time. In a similar way, for those of you who grew up during the, during the Cold War era, I was kind of on the back end of it. But it would be like saying, one day there will be open communication and peace between the U.S. and the USSR. There will be no more fear of mutually assured destruction. There will be no more arms races, space races, any kind of races. They won't be fighting each other for control because you know what? They will both realize they never had control. In that day, after this cataclysmic act of the Lord, those who remain in both Assyria and Egypt will acknowledge that the God of the Bible is the one who's truly in control, and they will come together to worship him. And then, at the very end of the chapter, it's like God cranks it all the way up to 11. And listen to what he says here. In that day, Israel will be the third with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the earth 
whom the Lord of hosts has blessed, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my inheritance. Okay, this should stop us in our tracks if we understand what's going on right here. Again, think back to the Exodus. You may remember this. With some of the plagues, especially like the plague of darkness and the, and the, the death of the livestock, God said, okay, Egypt, I'm going to pour all this out on you, but on the land of Goshen where my people live, they will have daylight just like normal. Their livestock will survive. Not even a dog will bark in their land because I'm going to make a distinction between Israel, my people, and Egypt, not my people. But here, that distinction is gone. He calls Egypt my people. He calls Assyria the work of my hands. He calls Israel my inheritance. All three of those titles are used in the Old Testament almost exclusively just to talk about the people of Israel, the people of God in the Old Testament. But by using these same titles to refer to nations like Assyria and Egypt, God's saying one day they will be my people too. This this changes everything. As you read through your Old Testament, from the moment in Genesis 12 that God calls Abraham and makes the promise to make him a great nation and bless all nations through him, we've known God's message, mission is to bring blessing to the nations through the people of Israel. But here, we see what the outcome of that blessing will be. This is not trickle-down Reaganomics blessing. This is not, I'll bless Israel and it'll filter down to the nations. But the outcome of the blessing that God intends to bring to the nations elevates them to the place where they are on equal footing with the people of Israel. One people of God made up of different tribes and tongues and languages and nations just like the Apostle John saw in Revelation chapter 5. And this is something we're not only looking to the future to see. This is a a blessing which we see unfold now in Jesus Christ. Look at the way that Paul describes this. We're not going to go into detail on this. There's a whole message we could preach from this one. But look at the way that Paul describes this. And if you are someone who is not of Jewish descent or you are of Jewish descent, this should be precious to us. Therefore, remember it that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh, non-Jewish people, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Jesus Christ, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For He Himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in His flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that He might create in Himself one new man, new humanity in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile both us both to God in one body through the cross. And He came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through Him, we both, Jew, Gentile, red and yellow, black and white, all are precious in His sight. We have access in one Spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. This is precious. Through Jesus Christ, And only through Jesus Christ, people from every tongue and tribe and language and nation can become a part of the one eternal family of God. We see revealed here God's mission to take the entire fragmented, jumbled up, divided human race with all of its beautiful and often baffling diversity and unite us together in Jesus Christ to make us into one people. Not uniform, always looking the same and talking the same, but one diverse, unified people living in peace under the rule of our Prince of Peace. That's where this whole story is going. Sadly, this amazing promise, it's not that every person from every nation will enjoy this, but the promise is that people from every nation will enjoy it. A remnant 
from every tribe and tongue and language and nation. We'll get more into that idea of a remnant in what we look at next week. But turn your attention back to Isaiah 19. In the end, blessed be Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my inheritance. I wonder how this message would have been received by the people of Judah in Isaiah's day. Would this have been good news to them? As Terry often says, this probably went over like a fart in church. <laughs> what? Didn't expect that. If you want, Terry's got a whole book in his head of these amazing one-liners. But I just think, man, it would have landed so awkwardly. Isaiah gets the people to this point of saying, yeah, that's right, all these people are going down. Yeah, that's right, trust God. <gasps> Wait, God wants to do what? He wants to do what with the Egyptians and the Assyrians? The bad guys? They'll be his people too? We'll be third on that list? This would be like someone at the 4th of July barbecue getting up there to sing God bless America and saying God bless Iran instead. Well, hold on. No, no, no. Hold on. Not only would the people not have anticipated it, they would have hated it to hear this. The bad guys... The oppressors, the criminals, God's going to bless them too? We like the idea of God being gracious to us. We like the idea of God having favor on the group that we choose to identify with. Because we all inherently think we're the good guy in the story. Our group is the group that God would want to root for and support. But when we read passages like this of God being equally gracious to the oppressors, to the enslavers, to the perpetrators of injustice, how dare he? That, I would say, is the, the scandalousness, the scandal of God's grace. None of us deserve his grace. God doesn't owe any of us mercy or salvation. So often we get in these theological wrestles talking and trying to figure out what it means for humans to have free will when it comes to salvation. That it can be so easy to miss the fact that the entirety of our salvation is an act of God's free will. His completely complete freedom to show mercy and grace to whomever He wants to. Even if it's not who we want Him to be gracious to. And it's only those who realize that they're not the hero, that they are the villain. Only those who come to the end of themselves like Isaiah did in chapter 6 and go, I am a man of unclean lips and I live amongst a people of unclean lips. I have no right to claim any, even to survive an encounter with the God of the Bible. I have no right to expect anything from him but his pure, unmitigated wrath. Only those who come to the end of themselves can begin to appreciate and receive the scandalous grace of God and even begin to extend that same grace to others, to their enemies, to those their group doesn't like, to those who are different from them. Here's how I want to wrap up. As I was looking at this whole section this week, it struck me that the people of Judah in Isaiah's day are a lot like many who claim to be Christians in America today. For as much as many who claim the name of Christ have turned away from him in order to live however they want, they still really, really like the idea of God being their mascot. They really like the idea that God's on their side, that he wears their colors, that he flies their flag, that he cheers for their team, that he supports their causes. But a passage like this should give us pause to remember that God is the king of the universe, that he is the one who gives life and breath to all people, that he is no nation's mascot. His mission is far greater than that. His mission is far greater than to make any one nation great. He is gathering people from every nation to be a part of His kingdom. And if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, make no mistake, this, His kingdom, is where your true identity and allegiance lies. 
as Americans, this gets so muddled and twisted up for us. And we have to do some separating work to remember our true allegiance, our true identity, like we did when we celebrated communion, is to Christ and his kingdom, which will embrace people from every tribe and tongue and language and nation. This should not cause us to withdraw and isolate ourselves from American culture because look around the room. We are living proof that God is still saving and calling people from America into his kingdom. Praise God for that. But what may not come as naturally to us is this. God is saving and calling people from Iran into his kingdom. God is saving and calling people from the Palestinian territories into his kingdom. God is calling and saving people from both South and North Korea. God is rescuing and ransoming people from South and Central America, even those from South and Central America who are trying to get into this country, even those who, whether legal or not, have come into this country. Is your hope attached to that mission? Are you asking God to bless that mission, that global mission, Are you building your life on that foundation? Or are you actually, in the posts you put on Facebook, in the way that you vote, in the way that you get so hot and bent about so many things, are you actually living in opposition to God's global mission? Let me be clear. I am grateful to be a citizen of this nation. Right now, I am especially grateful for the freedom of speech to talk publicly and openly with you about these things. But to be honest, this week, several times I heard that song, God Bless America, over the 4th of July holiday. And every time I hear it, I am I'm reminded not that, it, not that I don't want God to bless and rescue people from America, but that is such a small-minded song. I wonder, this is a thought in my head, I wonder if all the times God heard people who claim the name of Christ sing God bless America this week, he, and he's thinking, and? God bless America, and? Is there anything else after that? Have you read my book? Do you understand that I have something so much better in mind than just to bless this one nation? God is on a mission to bring blessing to people from every nation, not just this one. That's what he wants to do. Is that what you want him to do? Are you willing to join him in that mission? We live in uncertain times. Every generation has. That's the nature of our world right now. Before the return of Jesus Christ, there will be uncertainty and instability. But God works in our midst, in the midst of this uncertainty, to reveal to us where our hope truly lies and to show us how unstable everything else is but Him. This week, we were all reminded that even the ground under our feet is unstable. Christ is the solid rock, His love is the firm foundation. We have a mission to accomplish here to call others to build their lives on that firm foundation. That's why we're here. Would you pray with me? (sighs) Father, we confess that our hearts are so wily. We so easily run to so many things that have the appearance of stability and security or even just escape and numbing us. Lord, would you show us how unstable and crumbly those things are? That we might despair of hope and things and created stuff and instead lean upon you I pray even as we sing this song, confess our desire to build our life on your love. I pray that you in the same way would show us who you are and fill us with your heart and lead us in your love to those around you because you are rescuing people from every tribe and tongue and language and nation. Praise you for that, Lord Jesus. I pray this in your name. Amen.